Steps, promoting patient safety, improving health. I'm Adam Hoffman of the West Virginia Step Center, West Virginia University, and this is Tachycardia. This, is part of, this lecture is part of a larger American Heart ACLS course offered to the third year medical students at WVU. So th today we're going to be talking about tachycardia and as it relates to ACLS. So I want to preface this with a definition of tachycardia. So tachycardia is a heart rate greater than 150. But there's a caveat to this. And the first line of this algorithm is assess for appropriateness of clinical condition. What does that mean? What they're talking about here is, is the patient's tachycardia a compensatory mechanism from something else? For example, if this is a patient who was just in a car wreck and is bleeding internally, that's going to be a compensatory heart rate, not tachycardia for tachycardia's sake. So in that case, you want to treat the underlying cause. So things like sepsis, anaphylaxis, uh, hypovolemia, any of your other shock states can cause this tachycardia. So we want to start with assess for the appropriateness of clinical condition. So if this is tachycardia for tachycardia's sake, and this runaway tachycardia that, that we're concerned about here in this patient, then we want to look at the first things first. So what's the most obvious thing you're going to notice when you put this patient on the monitor? Is their heart rate narrow or wide? Right? That's a really easy one to tell you. Just look at the monitor and go, oh, that's either narrow or wide. So once we've decided whether it's narrow or it's wide, we're gonna start breaking it down a little bit more. So is it narrow? And then it's regular or irregular, okay? All right, so fast, narrow, regular. Most commonly, this is SVT. It's not the only thing that it could be, but classically, this is an SVT, okay? So, sinus tack, runaway sinus tack greater than 150. Okay? So from here, we're gonna break it down just a little bit further. And we're gonna talk about is the patient stable or unstable? Now, I wanna pause here for just a minute and wanna discuss what is stable versus unstable. So if the patient is stable, we're talking about um, these patients with this runaway heart rate, right? That don't show things like chest pain, shortness of breath, altered mental status, hypotension. And one thing we like to call the signs and symptoms of shock. What does that mean? Essentially, that's all of those other factors that are a little harder to put your finger on, right? Diaphoresis, poor lip margins, poor skin color, right? All of those things that make your patient unstable. So when I, when I talk about stable versus unstable, we're talking about chest pain, shortness of breath, hypotension, altered mental status, and the kind of signs and symptoms of shock, if you will. Okay? So, if none of those are present, our, we'll, we'll say our patient's stable. So there's some things we want to do here right off the bat. The first one on the list here for this is vagal maneuvers. We we'll talk about vagal maneuvers you hear a lot from our medical students about carotid massage. And carotid massage does work. It's actually very effective. But there's a distinct downside to carotid massage. Carotid massage, if there's any plaque buildup in the carotid artery, um, you can break that loose and cause a stroke. So in the otherwise healthy 20-something patient, right, vagal maneuvers with a carotid massage is probably, that's probably appropriate. Um, but know that there's a high risk here. A lot of our patients are not otherwise healthy 20-somethings. So know that if you're doing this, um, there are better, easier vagal maneuvers to use, right? So for example, the Valsal maneuver, blowing against the closed glottis, uh, like you're popping your ears. That's a good one. The patients, if they're responsive, they can talk to you. They can be doing that one on their own, and you should see their heart rate drop. Uh, bear down like you're gonna have a bowel movement is another great vagal maneuver. Oftentimes, patients won't bear down hard enough. So one thing you can do is push on their belly, right? Don't let me push on your belly. Cause them to really flex and squeeze those abdominal muscles. That'll often drop their heart rate very quickly. Right? Um, another one is the, uh, is a root is the mammalian diving reflex. This works best in kids and it's actually cold water immersion. So what you're gonna do is take a bag of ice and water, you sit the kid up, you put that bag of ice over their face and lay them down quickly. That stimulates the, what's called the mammalian diving reflex and allows otters and the like to swim for long periods on, in cold water. Their heart rate should immediately drop. The only downside with that is you tend to lose it as you get older. So it works best, it's most effective in children. 
So you can always try those vagal maneuvers. Oftentimes you can be doing these vagal maneuvers for a lot of our different rhythms while you're getting set up to do something else. Right? So then the next drug on the list here is a denison. Denison is very effective in this class of patients. You'll often, it's given six milligrams and then 12 milligrams, and there's a caveat with a denison. It's metabolized in the blood as a half-life of about six seconds. So it has to be given in a rapid IV push with a rapid IV flush behind it. You also want to give it with as big access as you can get as close to the heart as you can get. So ideally a 16 or an 18 gauge catheter in the antecubital space is going to be a lot better than a 22 in the back of the hand or the foot, right? So Denison, quick push, quick flush with saline, and then you should see a compensatory pause. So when you watch your monitor, you should see a five to six second run of asystole after giving this case. And of course, in this class, this is going to be the drug of choice. All right, also on the list here, we can always give calcium channel blockers and beta blockers. So think metropolol for the beta blockers, diltiazem for the calcium channel blockers. Right? Um, but note that calcium channel blockers and beta blockers often cause hypotension. So that's the real concern here in this class. And miodarone is, is not inappropriate here. And of course, one of my favorite drugs is procainamide. If the patient's truly stable, procainamide is a, a really good drug of choice as well. Know that procainamide can take up to 24 hours to work, so the patient really needs to be stable and maintain that stability over time. So, one of the things I like most about the tachycardic algorithm is that you have all of these treatment options, but at the end of the day, you hold the trump card. You can choose to cardiovert the patient. So, if none of this works, you can always cardiovert the patient. Now, if they're unstable, if the patient is unstable, they present with a chest pain or shortness of breath, hypotension, altered mental status, the signs and symptoms of shock we're, we're concerned about, right? We just immediately go to cardioversion. We don't, do not pass go, do not collect $200, immediately go to cardioversion, and that's to maintain, uh, to get them out of that rhythm as quickly as possible to lessen that cardiac damage. Okay, so let's go back up to the top here. Fast, greater than 150, narrow, and irregular. Classically, this is AFib doesn't have to be, but that's the classic rhythm here. And then we're going to talk about stable versus unstable again. All right, so in our irregular narrow complex rhythm, ideally or theoretically AFib with RVR, the stable rhythm, we're still going to try those vagal maneuvers. They may not work in this patient, but they're really easy, really fast to try, and you can be doing that while you're setting other things up. A denison is still appropriate here. If, if nothing else, a denison may not convert this patient, but they may slow it down for you to confirm that this is AFib. All right, calcium channel blockers, specifically probably diltiazem, and that's going to be the drug of choice uh, or the class of drugs of choice here. Beta blockers still are not inappropriate here, and beta blockers are still okay, with the caveat that they often cause hypotension. Amiodarone is okay here, and so is procainamide. All right, and then of course, if none of that works, we're gonna go to cardioversion. So diltiazem is typically our drug of choice here, and then if they're unstable, course we just go directly to cardioversion. All right so now let's talk about some Y complex rhythms here a little bit. So back up heart rate greater than 150 Y complex rhythm regular classically this is VTAC. All right so stable versus unstable VTAC. Now for the purposes of this algorithm We're assuming the patient has a pulse. If the patient doesn't have a pulse, we're not in the tachycardic algorithm. We're now in the VFib, VTAC algorithm. If the patient doesn't have a pulse, they immediately need defibrillated and CPR started, right? 
So in this case, Y, regular, and stable. So we're going to talk about stable VTAC. Now you can still do the vagal, adenosine, and all of those things. Know that they may not work. Adenosine may not be effective at all. It may slow it down for you to be able to see what the underlying rhythm is. Okay. Calcium channel blockers. Beta blockers are still on the list here. Okay. The drug of choice here, though, is amyl or amyotor. Now, amiodarone in this patient is given 150 over 10 minutes. I know you talked about in cardiac arrest, we're going to give 300 IV push, but remember amiodarone can affect the blood pressure in the short term. So if the patient has a pulse, they have a blood pressure, we need to protect that blood pressure 150 over 10 minutes. Okay? If they don't have a pulse, they don't have a blood pressure, I don't need to worry about protecting it, 300 IV push. So 150 over 10 minutes, and that's dosed in D5. And of course, also procainamide is still on the list here, if the patient truly is that stable. And when in doubt, if, if anything changes, or if you try these and nothing's working, we can always just cardiovert them. And the same, as soon as the patient becomes unstable, we can cardiovert them. These patients often will present initially as pretty stable, uh, but will become unstable. All right, so our last category is Y and irregular. Now, this is classically AFib with aberration. Okay. Well, what is AFib with aberration? Well, aberration is a fancy way of saying a left bundle branch block. So this is typically an AFib patient who has a concurrent left bundle branch block. However, there's a concern here. If this patient has an antidromic, or backwards if you will, Wolf-Parkinson's white pathway, giving them anything that blocks the AV node is exceedingly dangerous here. Because the patient, instead of normal and normal WPW, if there's such a thing, orthodromic pathways to polarize down the normal pathway from the SA node to the AV junction, and then repolarize the accessory pathway. In the antidromic pathway, they will depolarize the accessory pathway and repolarize up the normal pathway. In those patients, if you give them anything that's AV nodal blocking, you'll actually cycle the heart rate up and not down, and they'll go up to 250 or 300 and then go into V-fib. So there's only one safe drug here, and that's procainamide. Of course, these patients are likely to become unstable, uh, and procainamide can take 24 hours to work. So this is the only safe medication to give. Adenosine is probably safe, but only because of its short half-life. It's not that it won't cause that cycling up in heart rate, but it's gone in six seconds. So it's probably safe to try. But unless you're absolutely certain that this is AFib with aberration and not an antidromic, Wolf Parkinson's white. The only medication here is procainamide. And then, of course, in consult with cardiology, we'll cardiovert them. And if they're unstable at any point, we're just going to move straight to cardioversion. I hope this helps your understanding of tachycardia. I'm Adam Hoffman from West Virginia Steps. Have a great day.